two that have been uh, approved by the FDA under something called an emergency use authorization uh, are both effective and safe. And the benefit of these vaccines far outweigh the risk of getting COVID-19. And we're seeing spread across the state now uh, at levels that we didn't even see in the spring when our hospitals were filled. There's a lot of good reasons why, even though the virus is spreading now much worse than it was then, uh, our hospitals are not filled yet, thankfully. But uh, that could change on a dime. It's already uh, the case in California, for example, that uh, they're considering rationing care and hospitals and ICUs are filled, uh, which not only compromises care for you uh, if you have COVID-19, but really for any reason. Uh, remember what the hospital's situation was like uh, in the spring where folks were afraid to go to the hospital because they were afraid to catch COVID-19 if they had a serious condition uh, that required care, which caused its own uh, slew of public health problems. So uh, just a high level, I do believe the benefits outweigh the risks. Uh, the skepticism that we hear about uh, comes from, I think, three buckets uh, of assumptions that you know people have been making. And I want to just tackle uh, or concerns, uh, don't have to even be assumptions, just very good questions that people are asking about, you know, why they should be taking this vaccine. The first is uh, a general concern about how fast the process was. You know, the science was uh, in place for less than a year. Uh, the technology was uh, developed for this vaccine uh, in a matter of days, actually. Um, but manufacturing and everything to actually produce the vaccine took a little bit longer. Uh, and we're now still a little bit less than a year uh, since the first case in the United States, certainly the first case in New Jersey. And we now have a vaccine that we're asking you to take. And we're asking you to take it if you're above 65 right now, or if you have a chronic condition and you're between the ages, uh, depending on the vaccine, either 16 or 18 to 64, with a chronic disease like type 2 diabetes, obesity, smoking, um, other conditions that portend for a much worse outcome if you do get COVID-19. Um, and so that means it's here and it's available to the community now in multiple va mass vaccination sites. All that said, that happened very quickly uh, in less than a year. And a lot of folks have good questions about why that's the case. The second category um, of skepticism has a lot to do uh, with, you know, and some of this is related to the first category, but, you know, concerns about adverse events. You know, there's uh, every time there's a severe allergic reaction, or every time uh, somebody in the trial had something like Bell's palsy or a different uh, nerve condition that causes uh, you know, temporary paralysis and then comes back. All of these things were reported in the media and sensationalized. Uh, but the fact is, you know, those things are extremely rare. And when you compare them to the placebo arm, there's actually no difference, difference. between the folks who got the vaccine and folks who got a decoy uh, to test whether it was working. So that's another bucket of concerns. And then the third is really a set of legitimate, in my view, uh, concerns about, you know, look, all right, let's say uh, all the funding, the will, the science was legitimate, if, if not fast, uh, all of that made sense. And I believe you that it works. Why aren't you seeing the same degree of mobilization for, you know, other public health problems that have been plaguing black and brown communities, uh, inclusive of Muslims, but of course, everyone else? Um, in vulnerable communities who have been dealing with uh, later stage cancer than most when they're diagnosed or uh, higher maternal mortality rates or higher HIV rates. Uh, and, you know, we haven't seen this degree of mobilization or effort for any of those problems. Uh, so, you know, that it's messed up. We have to think about why we're not seeing the will and the funding and the mobilization for things that have been affecting people for a long time, especially people of color. And so for that, we really just have to make a promise and I think get uh, from the platform of progress and, and, and equity, uh, but also just public health through this process and, and make promises about the next challenges we're gonna face in public health and how we're gonna tackle those for vulnerable communities as well. I wanna go back quickly to that first bucket. Why was the science so fast and why could it be done so fast? Especially when the uh, next fastest development of vaccine was four years. That was the polio vaccine. So this is a quarter of the time taken to develop this vaccine. So a couple things. The first is that two, the two vaccines that are out now are based on the same technology, mRNA-based technology. And what mRNA is, for folks who aren't familiar, it's basically a blueprint that your body uses to make proteins. So essentially we're made out of proteins, uh, fat, 
and water, essentially. And uh, so proteins do the business of what your body does. They digest food. Uh, you know, they make sure that your uh, brain is working, your organs are working. Proteins do the job uh, in life and, and basically make life run. And so mRNA is a natural molecule that your body makes for all of the proteins it makes. So what the mRNA vaccine is, is it's not, usually vaccines are decoys. So the concept of a vaccine is you administer something that looks like the virus so that your immune system can get trained to understand what it looks like uh, and fight it with antibodies and immune cells. Um, and so the idea is you train it with something that's harmless or much less harmful uh, compared to the actual virus. And then if the real virus comes along, your immune system's already trained. And if even though it can go into your nose or you can breathe it in, uh, your immune system will immediately attack it because it's trained to do so. So that's the concept of a vaccine. So what this technology does is it actually doesn't um, involve administering the decoy protein. It administers the blueprint for your own body to actually make the protein. So your own body makes the protein at no risk to your DNA and no risk to uh, you know, anything in terms of your genetics. That's a myth uh, if you've heard about that. Uh, but it uses the machinery outside of where your DNA is completely separate to make the decoy proteins. And so that's how your immune system learns how to fight it. Uh, so there's also a misunderstanding that the technology was developed in just a, a couple of months, the entire baseline technology to make this. No, actually, uh, for the better part of a decade, people have been working on this concept for vaccines. And uh, too much success actually in the last couple of years in generating immune responses for other things. So this was actually a, a somewhat of a tried and true technology and they were waiting for the next big uh, virus to vaccinate against and working on that. But now they had their chance and they literally, because it's a blueprint that's easy to construct, it's the basic um, blueprint of, of your um, protein you wanna make, they actually designed it in a weekend. Uh, and the people who designed the Pfizer vaccine were actually two Turkish Muslims who did so. And so uh, an incredible feat, they designed it in, in just a few days and um, you know, produced it, tested it in uh, Petri dishes and then animals uh, for the basic concept of understanding if it generates an immune response, and it did. So they then moved to the clinical trials. And the clinical trials is when you actually test it in humans. And um, what they did for the clinical trials is that usually it happens in three phases. Phase one tests the safe dosing, uh, what doses do not cause bad reactions. Phase two is a combination between uh, de determining what doses are likely to generate a biological response and also a little bit of safe dosing as well. And then phase three is when you really compare uh, the vaccine to a decoy, a fake, the placebo, to see if it actually works and whether it's safe. So they did all three trials at the same time. And so you may what, might ask yourself, why don't they do that for other stuff? Well, this was an unprecedented investment from the federal government that completely eliminated the risk for the pharmaceutical companies to develop this. So normally, the pharmaceutical companies have to pay for all the science themselves. And so to minimize their financial risk, they take a much longer time and do the trials in phases. So that if phase one fails, they don't have to spend the money and time on phase two, three, and then finally manufacturing and developing it. Not only did they get all the money needed to conduct the trials, they got all the money needed to manufacture millions and millions of doses of these vaccines up front, all the way back in the spring when Operation Warp Speed was developed. So in an environment where there's no financial risk, when there's tremendous political will uh, to get us out of this pandemic, yes, they were able to, able to proceed very fast in designing, manufacturing, and bringing these uh, vaccines to trial. You might ask, okay, well, the trials themselves usually take much longer uh, than six months, even when you start a trial it's often followed for at least a couple of years. Well, these trials will go for a couple of years, uh, but what they did here is that they, in order to get answers fast about whether these vaccines were effective and safe, they had much larger trials than normal. So we're talking about tens of thousands of people enrolled in these trials, when the normal size of clinical trials is only about three, 4,000 people. So because they were able to have such large trials, statistically, you can detect much smaller differences in effect between that vaccine arm and the placebo. It's all about comparing, especially in phase three, 
uh, how effective a vaccine is versus a fake vaccine. Uh, because the placebo effect actually is real. So I was in the clinical trial myself for the Moderna vaccine. I got the placebo. My body and my mind thought I got the vaccine and I actually had symptoms, uh, significant symptoms. In fact, I missed a day of work in my second dose. It was all in my head. Now, that's what the placebo effect is. Uh, and it works even in people who know about it and know about science and are in healthcare themselves. So that's why you have to actually compare it to a placebo arm. And it turned out that these are actually one of the most effective vaccines we've ever seen in healthcare. 95% of the people who took the vaccine did not get the virus, did not get sick from the virus, versus much higher levels in the placebo arm. So because the trials were big uh, and because, frankly, the pandemic was not well controlled in the United States and in many parts of the world, the people in the placebo arm got COVID at very high rates. So it was easy to compare a, and determine a difference between the trial arm and the placebo arm very fast because the pandemic was so poorly managed nationally. So it's an irony of you know, the fact that, of course, hundreds of thousands of people have died, so many have gotten sick, but because of that, people in the placebo arm did get COVID at much higher rates and we, know, we knew that very fast. So those, I think, are the good reasons why the science was done so fast and so well. And frankly, again, the will to get all the gears of government moving, including the FDA, including the CDC, there was a demand that people do this fast because it was universal. People want to get out of this pandemic. And sometimes the bureaucracy gets in the way too. People have to wait for FDA decisions, that delays time. Uh, none of that happened this time. So I think there's a lot of good reasons that even though the science was done quickly, um, there's good reasons for why it was still done well. And I very much believe in the science. And so that gets into the second category. What are the real side effects and the real risks? Uh, some of the myths that I've heard uh, just swirling around on social media and what have you, uh, that it causes uh, infertility and that it's a, uh, some people even say it's a conspiracy to cause infertility in uh, communities of color. Not true. No effect on fertility, uh, no effect on your germ cells uh, that are in reproduction. Absolutely no noticed effect. And that was tracked, by the way, as a possible side effect. Um, another is that, you know, uh, there was embryonic stem cells used. And so a lot of people for ethical reasons, including in the Muslim community, uh, do not agree with embryonic stem cell research because it involves taking an embryo and using those cells for the basic science research. None of that was done. Uh, for these vaccines. It's all synthetic um, and made in a lab, but not made using embryonic cells. And there are a slew of other things about Bell's palsy, um, you know, some of these scary neurologic conditions. Actually, a couple of those things happened, but a couple of those things also happened in the placebo arm. So when you have a trial with tens of thousands of people in it, and uh, you have tens of thousands of people in both arms, you're gonna get some percentage of people that have some scary uh, diseases. The whole point about doing the trial is to determine whether those diseases or those adverse events have anything to do with the vaccine. And the fact that there were similar rates in both arms tells you that it didn't. Uh, that unfortunately, just some people happen to be in the trial and also happen to have those severe side effects. So there's really uh, an extremely low rate uh, also of severe allergic reactions, something called anaphylaxis, where uh, you're allergic to something, you're exposed to it, your throat closes up, and you have very difficult, uh, a lot of difficulty breathing, um, and you need to be injected with an emergency medication called epinephrine. That happens in about one in 100,000 people who takes one of these vaccines. Compare that to the risk of it happening with penicillin or a different antibiotic. That risk is one in 2,000. So hundreds and actually thousands of times more likely to get anaphylaxis from an antibiotic. One in 200 likelihood to get anaphylaxis from anything else in your lifetime. So about half a percent chance that you will have a severe allergic reaction from something you don't even know about at some point in your life. One in 100,000 is an extremely, extremely low risk. Also, where you're going to get the vaccine, there's going to be people there who have epinephrine just in case. And you have to be observed for 15 minutes to make sure you don't have a severe allergic reaction. So even if you're one, that one in 100,000 unlucky person, uh, anaphylaxis is a tried and true treatment that has never failed to treat an allergic reaction. 
Um, and so, you know, that medication is available in case it's needed, hasn't been needed yet in New Jersey, uh, as far as I'm aware. And it just goes to show what the real risk is of some of these severe side effects. Finally, I'll, I'll just round out with that third, very appropriate source of skepticism that I mentioned, which is, you know, look, there are things that plague the Muslim community in terms of public health issues, uh, black community, uh, Latino, Latina, you know, all these other uh, South Asian, all these other ethnic groups that have a lot of uh, public health problems and incidents of chronic disease. So you may ask, all right, look, well, you've proven you can do this fast and you, he's very successful with it. And so what I would do is, is really level that call to action to, uh, you know, folks, not only at the state, but at the federal government. And it's really encouraging to me uh, that the Biden administration is taking health equity seriously. Uh, there is a, a director of health equity named Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, who's out of the White House, uh, who ultimately reports, um, you know, to very senior people and very close to the president-elect uh, and the vice president-elect, who consider this to be a very important priority. Um, and I can tell you that there's going to be very ambitious uh, public health agenda that goes well beyond COVID-19. Um, and you can already see through the president-elect's economic agenda, um, uh, you know, agenda around so many other topics uh, that prioritizing equity and prioritizing, uh, you know, vulnerable communities is right up there uh, near the top of his list, which makes me encouraged. Um, and frankly, you know, this has been embraced across the board with political leadership, the vaccine. I know there's a lot of mistrust in politicians, regardless of your uh, political persuasion. But uh, I can tell you the science is behind this, the will is behind this, and I trust it, um, and I've taken it. So I'm happy to answer questions, but it's a pleasure to just give a quick overview. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Anahal. Uh, what I'm going to do, uh, inshallah, uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Nadim and Dr. Hatham also to join in, inshallah, just to touch on a few things, and, and uh, I'm... Uh, here to try to level the uh, uh, playing field to bring down maybe some of the scientific and medical discourse to the common man, uh, such as myself. Um, so just a couple of things if I can just uh, tease out of you uh, or, and, and see if you can um, explain maybe a little bit more clearer. So we're hearing about the, there's the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, we're also hearing about the Oxford vaccine, the China vaccine, this, that. Uh, what are the, I guess, major differences of Johnson & Johnson is supposedly coming out with one as well. Um, you know, what are the major differences between them? Um, and, uh, you know, I guess the effects that they were have in terms of success rates uh, that are there. You got it, Dr. Nahal? Oh, okay, I, I'll start. I didn't know if it was too oh, yeah, okay. So uh, there are uh, some uh, notable differences between uh, Pfizer. We're gonna... Can people hear me? Yes. You're good. Yes. Okay, I didn't know if, okay, good. I didn't know if that was just Sammy. Uh, Sammy's, uh, Sammy's thing got glitchy. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, sounds good. So there, there are some notable differences. Um, okay, in, I'm glitchy. Okay, sorry. You're back. I can hear you perfectly, Sammy. Um, so yes, there are some noticeable differences in side effects between Moderna and Pfizer, and we have the most information by the way, on those two, because they released their uh, phase three clinical trial data, which really gets to the likelihood of side effects and the likelihood and the effectiveness. Uh, Moderna has slightly more intense side effects, especially with the second dose. Um, you know, but in those side effects that last about one to two days, uh, they include fever uh, in a lower percentage of people, low grade fever, uh, but much more commonly, uh, you know, pain at the injection site fatigue, um, headache, you know, symptoms that are actually pretty common with the flu vaccine, maybe a little bit more intense with the COVID vaccines, but uh, are short-lived and are certainly not severe adverse events. And that's something to really clarify. Side effects that are short-lived are actually a good sign. It's a sign that your immune system is working and uh, learning what the, what the virus looks like and responding and building that army of antibodies and immune cells that will be able to fight the virus. Um, so there's a little bit of a difference in side effects, absolutely no difference in effectiveness. 95% uh, effectiveness for both of those vaccines, uh, which is very promising. Johnson & Johnson just released 
uh, their phase one data, which looks at safe dosing and looks at phase one, actually in a little bit of phase two, um, and looks at whether the vaccine generated an immune response in humans. So basically they gave the vaccine in an arm of the trial and they looked at whether somebody developed antibodies or not. And the antibody response rate was very good, uh, which is not surprising because as we learned from the first two vaccines, this is a very vaccinable virus, but it's actually a property of viruses whether you can vaccinate against them or not. Uh, and you know, alhamdulillah, this happens to be a virus where we can generate effective vaccines. So it does seem like it does generate an immune response. And the side effects were very similar to Moderna and Pfizer, but we don't yet have the effectiveness uh, in preventing COVID-19 data yet for Johnson & Johnson. So uh, that remains to be seen. Hopefully it's anywhere near as effective as 95%. By the way, just as a benchmark, we're lucky in any given year if the flu vaccine is 60, 65% effective. Uh, so that's the standard we're used to with vaccines. We're talking about mid nineties with these vaccines. And then there's much less information available about the other candidates, the AstraZeneca, uh, you know, there's uh, a few, a couple of others in the pipeline. And as these things come out, you're gonna see the same process. The FDA is gonna look at it the CDC is gonna bless it after the FDA does and they'll be approved, approved under emergency use. If, if I uh, can follow up in terms of these studies that were done, uh, one of the community members has a question regarding, so if we're talking about, uh, for example, children uh, are not, have not been tested, I guess, so we're not sure of the effects upon that. Um, but is it true also that immunocompromised uh, patients or the elderly have not been part of the trial as well? Is there additional risks that they should be concerned about if there are no uh, uh, groups? Yeah, so uh, children were not uh, part of the clinical trials, which is why it's currently not recommended for children, even in the expanded uh, prioritization that Governor Murphy just announced. Um, we, don't, we don't have enough information yet. Um, and also, thankfully, the virus is not nearly as severe in children on average. Uh, so those two things uh, make us want to avoid that group for now. Uh, yes, so the clinical trials did not include um, you know, people with unstable chronic disease, people who are immunocompromised, and uh, people in long-term care facilities because you know, they're very elderly and uh, otherwise people who need institutional care were not part of the clinical trials, but folks in those groups uh, are actually encouraged to take it. And uh, the, uh, that, that is a little bit of a leap of faith, to be honest with you, because they were not in the trial, so I can't claim scientifically that it's guaranteed to work in those individuals. But knowing, for example, that long-term care, uh, people in you know, nursing homes were uh, accounted for almost 40% you know, of the deaths in our state and across the country uh, because of how vulnerable they are to this virus. There was a, you know, a decision made by the panel that recommends uh, prioritization out of the CDC. It's called uh, ASIP. Uh, they recommended that these groups be included anyway because the side effect profile and the effectiveness was so impressive that it's very unlikely that these vaccines will have uh, a significantly different result. When it comes to effectiveness, let's say in immunocompromised folks that it's only 70% effective. And by the way, uh, the only reason immunocompromised folks are, uh, there's a concern there is that they don't have the same high functioning immune systems that most of us do. And so the question is, hey, are you just giving me the risks without the benefit, right? And so, uh, but let's say, you know, it's 30, 40% less effective. You're still in a, a range of effectiveness that we have accepted for a long time for the vaccine. And so there are good reasons why we uh, extended, or at least the scientific community is comfortable extending it to other groups. Uh, but again, I can't, I can't claim that there's hard scientific data on that in as much as I can for the other groups. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hatem, if you're there, um, if you can uh, uh, turn on your camera. Uh, Dr. Hatem is a familiar face, obviously, to the MBIC community, um, and you've been uh, actively involved in working on the front line. Um, could you address maybe uh, the, uh, you know, one of the things you realize sort of as, as somebody who's involved in, in the Muslim community in Masjid that, that this thing, the virus is very much alive. Um, but I think due to isolation um, and sometimes people not hearing about what's going on, uh, that imams hear about, that others, those on the front lines hear about, people dying or being sick, et cetera. 
uh, they tend to think that actually this is all over and there's a lot of hoopla about nothing. Um, and so Dr. Hatta, maybe if you could speak to that in terms of working in the hospitals and ICU units, ICU units um, is it something that in the central Jersey we are facing? Uh, you know, is the upsurge there uh, that we were facing uh, like before? Yeah, so I come. Thank you, Dr. Sharif, for uh, uh, you know covering so much. Uh, and a lot of the questions are are taking notes and have been answered um, uh, with your talk. Um, I see a very skewed uh, population uh, in the intensive care unit, um, and um, we had the first wave in March, April, and uh, May. Uh, we, I was hopeful that the worst was over, uh, but again, uh, as you, you see in the numbers in the, from the state, um, the numbers are up again, and um, our, our numbers in the ICU are, are getting close to where they were in the spring. Um, this is not a disease of, of the elderly only. This is not a disease of um, people who have cancer or are very uh, immunocompromised, um, and I can't impress enough on the community to still follow the um, state regulations and to be careful. Um, we have patients in their 30s and 40s and 50s without pre-existing conditions that are still getting sick. Um, I'm a little concerned about this this new variant. Uh, maybe Shreve, Dr. Shreve can um, uh, comment about that. Uh, the UK variant that um, we're seeing spreading um, uh, more, especially in the youth and, and the uh, uh, younger population. Um, I believe from my understanding, the, the vaccine will still uh, be effective um, against this variant, um, but maybe Dr. Sharif can, can comment. Yeah, so um, it's a really good question. And there's a lot of, I think, very justified concern on whether the vaccines will be effective against the variants. So first of all, what, it, what, is the, what is the variant? Why do variants exist? All that is, um, it, the viruses mutate. And the reasons they mutate is the machinery that replicate the genetic material that make the proteins, the process I was talking about before, that machinery isn't perfect. Um, it, it's fail safe most of the time, but you know, one in millions and millions likelihood that you get a mutation in the, so these are RNA viruses and the RNA, which is that blueprint again, uh, that makes the actual virus and makes it replicate and makes you sick. And so because uh, you are, when you're infected, your body is replicating this thing millions and millions and millions of times in each person who gets it, there are going to be mutations that happen. And some of these mutations, actually vast majority, make the virus less effective. And so that mutated one in a billion virus will just die out and be ineffective. But even lower likelihood, but certainly still possible, sometimes you get a mutation that makes the virus even better at spreading or uh, even worse from a symptom and disease standpoint. So uh, for the two variants that we know about, one that was discovered in the UK, one that was discovered in South Africa, we know that those mutations make the virus more easily spread. So far, there's no evidence that they make the virus more severe if you do get it. However, easier to spread in a virus that is already very effective at spreading is extremely concerning. Uh, that is actually the most important factor that will determine ultimately the number of deaths and the number of long-term health conditions. The um, replicability, the ability to transmit and spread uh, is the much more important factor ultimately because you can have a virus like Ebola, which you, know, you have a 50% chance of dying if you get it, very severe virus. But because of that, and because it causes such severe symptoms, you're not likely to spread it to somebody else, much less likely. And the method of transmission is actually direct fluid contact, uh, fluid to fluid. So much different from a, a virus that can be transmitted through an aerosol across the room, which is what this is. So ultimately the transmission factor makes it very scary. Uh, what it does is it doubles down on the fact that until we do have 70 to 80% of the population vaccinated, you have to continue to wear this and you have to socially mm -hmm. distance, you have to avoid gatherings. That's what meeting. To Limit the, limit the chance of spread. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah sorry. Okay. So um, the next uh, question is whether the vaccines will work if they're mutated. And so 
from everything we know about so far, it does seem like the vaccines still work against these mutations. They're not in areas that really do the business of getting inside a cell and the spike part of the protein, which is what we're vaccinating against. And so because of that, it's very unlikely that it's going to affect the vaccine uh, efficacy. Uh, we won't know for sure until specific studies come out about sequencing. And uh, sequencing is, sorry, the process that you do to figure out what mutated variant you have, whether you have it or not. Uh, we still need to do more research, but there's a strong um, hopeful, there's a hope, and I think it's a, a well-placed hope that the vaccines will be just as effective, or even if they're slightly less effective, again, maybe it gets in the 80% range or 70s, still quite effective. So um, we're still doubling down on vaccinating as many people as possible, as fast as possible. So, so just for the sake of, again, for emphasis, if you have the vaccine, you should be still wearing a mask. You're not, uh, you know, super human. Uh, the, the second thing is, um, uh, can you clarify just again, uh, this idea of, is it possible to be a carrier uh, if you have the vaccine? Um, and what's the threat of that uh, to others? Uh, because it also seems to be some confusion there. And, 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 and is that normal? Is that a normal thing, what we're hearing that is possible for you to spread it with other vaccines? Uh, or is this something unusual with this? No, it's a very good question. So first of all, um, yes, you still have to wear masks and socially distance because there's a chance that even if you're not sick from COVID-19 because you're immune to it, you can still spread it. It, can, it may be just living in your nose. It may be living uh, in your mouth. And uh, if you do get the vaccine and you're protected from getting sick, which is really what the vaccine does, it protects you from getting sick if you do get the virus. It doesn't prevent you from being exposed to the virus, right? So if you're exposed, you have, you're vaccinated, you, get, you can still carry it and spread it to someone else. We don't know exactly what the likelihood yet is of spread compared to somebody who's not vaccinated that's still being studied. Uh, but yes, you reduce the likelihood of spread if you've been vaccinated, uh, but it's still very possible to spread it, which is why, again, you still have to wear masks and you still have to do everything we can do until we reach that 70 to 80% threshold. It's really amazing when you look at the science, when you reach a certain tipping point of people vaccinated in a population, it becomes so unlikely that any given person will be vulnerable who comes in contact with somebody who's spreading the disease that effectively you're protecting everybody. And so it's really a, a battle, it's a collective action problem to get people vaccinated. And until then, the vaccine will only be partial protection, uh, which is why we still have to follow these restrictions. So yes, you can still spread it. And at baseline, by the way, with this virus, you can spread it if you're asymptomatic. So that makes it even more likely if you're, you're vaccinated to be an asymptomatic carrier who's spreading it. Dr. Hatta, Dr. Nadim, if you feel to join in, please do at any point. Yes, uh, assalamu alaikum, uh, Shari. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate all the great um, uh, this, this uh, talk and discussion and really enlightening us all, uh, healthcare professionals and lay people on the vaccine. Um, I had a few questions I'm gonna run by you again, um, just to hit on the vaccine. Uh, first question I had is for people who've had COVID, um, should they get the vaccine or not? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's another one that people are saying, well, hey, what gives? I thought I was immune. Mm -hmm. uh, because I got the virus. And the data that we are aware of uh, for people who've actually had COVID-19 and recovered, most people have immunity that lasts certainly at least 90 days. And recently we have six month data that shows that uh, most people still do have that immunity that lasts, but we don't know exactly how long immunity lasts across the spectrum of people. And we do know that older people, uh, as, as much as they're uh, vulnerable to COVID-19. Part of that's because they have, you know, compromised or less effective immune systems at baseline. And so um, we know that the vaccine is protective at least to a point of six months, uh, even for elderly people and even for people with chronic disease, that picture is much more murky for people who have actually had the virus. And so as far as we know, the vaccine is actually more protective in terms of immune reaction and lasting immunity than getting the virus, part of that may be because you're getting two injections. So it's like you're, you're getting the virus twice 
and you're really priming your immune system to learn well uh, and how to build up that immunity. Now, mm. it may be the case that everybody's immunity goes away in a year, regardless of whether you take the vaccine or uh, the virus itself. And so if that's the case, this is not going to be just a one-time thing. It'll be an annual vaccine in as much as the flu is an annual vaccine. So we don't know yet. We're going to see as data matures um, and we get more information, whether how often we can get it, we need to get it, whether it's every year, just once in your lifetime, once every five years, it could be anything in between. Great. Uh so that answer another question I have for Sharif. Now, another question I also had along the lines is um, the actual, the current dosing schedule for Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, there's two doses. Moderna, is, you have to do it 28 days apart at minimum, or really ideally, and if the Pfizer one is 21 days apart. Um, how much does a first dose offer protection? Can people, people say, oh, I'm pretty well protected at first dose. I, want, I, shouldn't, get the, I shouldn't get COVID now. Um, you know, can you can you enlighten the, the community on that? Mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a great question, and it's actually being debated now, uh, in light of the fact that there's a limited vaccine supply, and there was some delays in the federal government delivering vaccine, and so some are advocating, hey, just move to one shot, even for the vaccines where the trials had two. I'm not there yet. I still think you need both shots. Um, the data that you have for uh, Pfizer and Moderna for the effectiveness of one shot is somewhere in the ballpark of around 70%, uh, maybe a little less for Moderna. But again, we uh, only have a certain time span of data where we can even understand what the answer to that question is based on the trials, because there was no arm in the trial that's being followed over time who only got one shot of those vaccines. That's the most scientific way to ask and answer that question with, with a trial. And that didn't happen. So, you know, these are just estimates and they're based on more, much more limited data of people who, um, you know, got the virus, even though they got one dose of vaccine and doing some roundabout calculations to figure out what the protectiveness is of one shot. I wouldn't trust it yet. I think if the trial showed 95% effectiveness with two shots, you take the two shots. And along those same lines, uh, with the second dose, should people... Is it any harm delaying the second dose beyond that recommended time limit? Like let's say someone is like has to wait now five weeks or six weeks because it's a scheduling issues. Is that considered a concern or a risk today? Yeah, and I'll say this by saying, of course, everyone should try their best to follow exactly how things were done in the trial because that's what we know works. But you know, life gets in the way, and some people may even get ill with something else. You should not take the vaccine, by the way, if you have the flu or you have something else. Uh, that's causing symptoms and causing your immune system to flare up. And so there are a lot of good reasons why some folks would have to delay longer. Uh, the recommendation is still to take that dose, uh, knowing that it's still very likely, even though we don't have that, uh, the trial was done very carefully. So almost everybody got the exact regimen. Mm -hmm. uh, but from everything we know about the science so far, we still very much think that that second dose will be effective, even if it's more delayed than normal. Right. Now, I guess is a question I'm going to ask that really highlights the, uh, I guess, the challenges that we're all facing um, throughout the community in getting the vaccine. Um, I was in my office today seeing patients, a 75-year-old guy telling me, doctor, I don't know where to get the vaccine. I signed up at the uh, state website expecting a response, and I haven't gotten a response. And I, I mean, I know you're not actively involved in government right now, but you obviously have obviously no people in government. You know, what can you tell the community? How can we advise people in our community who either are eligible or members of family who are eligible? How can we get the vaccine? How do we register for the vaccine? How do we, where do we go? What are resources? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this, the state website, just to be clear, is one of uh, many ways that you can actually ultimately get the vaccine. It's not the only way that you can do it. What they're trying to do is make it easier for people and connect as many you know, of these bigger mass vaccination sites that are being set up in convention centers, sporting arenas, et cetera, bigger spaces where you can socially distance. Um, and so, yeah, the state is helping uh, for those larger centers to schedule. But uh, what I would do is, you know, try to sign up there. And if it's not, um, you know, happening in a, a timely way as you want, uh, explore some of the more local options. Every county has its own setup. 
Uh, and in some cases you can call directly and schedule. I know in Essex County uh, where University Hospital is, they have their uh, call-in system and their own website in addition to the state website. And often you can get uh, into these centers much more quickly. There is a pressure to use these doses. We're getting doses and New Jersey, I think ranked 37 now out of 50 in terms of using the doses somewhere in that ballpark uh, compared to some other states. And so there, there are counties that are just itching to vaccinate people if you fall into one of these categories. So uh, I would look to your county website. I would you know, Google everything you can about your local area. Uh, and I know that a lot of folks are from in Middlesex who go to NBIC, NBIC. Governor was just in the Middlesex um, center that opened recently that's going to be vaccinating people. So uh, that's available to you now. Great. Um, I had a question, Sammy, I had a question from Dr. Shadi. Uh, to, uh, if you can comment quickly upon uh, any FIC issues or concerns about the, um, uh, the vaccines and uh, what the scholarly, Islamic scholarly community is saying about it, uh, given that I guess there's been some misinformation and confusion about the origins of the process of manufacturing these vaccines. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me? Just make mm -hmm. sure my mic is yes. on. All right, uh, I'm reading right in front of me here and I could post it for everybody. One of the more um, uh, uh, thorough and respectable uh, fatwa organizations is AMJA. Uh, they have a lot of fatwa on different things, but this one has been looked at. There are many, many fatwa on the vaccines because of the talk that it may be derived from pork, it may be derived from human, uh, from basically aborted babies. Uh, nonetheless, the fatwa on this, which I'm going to post right here for everyone to read, is stating that the transfer, if in the case that there are, is there anything, has been transformed so thoroughly that the prohibition on it, it is no longer considered negis. It's not considered ritually impure. And the reason we're not allowed to eat things is because it's negis, ritually impure. And therefore, because of this transformation, even if there is something like that, it's been transformed at such a chemical level that the Najas is no longer mu'tabar or considered, and Allah knows best. I'm not a mufti, but this is what many, 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 many muftis have said. I've read a lot of these fatawa. I've just given you one right here. There's many in Arabic, in English, and in other languages as well. So I've just put it here for everyone to read. It's a very simple fatwa that you could read in maybe three minutes. Uh, uh, Dr. Al-Hal, if, um, so, uh, if we can go back to, uh, you know, some community members had a question. If we can go back to uh, the idea of the scientific establishment or the medical establishment. So, again, uh, you know, we are privy as, you know, sort of a layman to certain or others or Google. Um, is there, uh, you know, and not privy maybe to the more researched uh, uh, sources uh, that you maybe as a part of the medical establishment uh, have access to. Is there any serious debate amongst uh, scientists and researchers on this issue, not just in the United States, but throughout the world uh, regarding, uh, I guess, the vaccines uh, and the effectiveness, uh, but more uh, importantly about the, the course of action of combating uh, the COVID uh, virus? Um, are you, do you mean just the, a strategy about how to end the pandemic? Yeah, I'm saying is 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 the idea of vaccination and herd immunity uh, sort of the accepted position of those within the scientific uh, community on how to come to combat this virus at this time, yes. at least based on the best evidence we know. I mean, based on the, all the information we know so far. Yes, overwhelmingly, and so you know the the there's a debate, um, and I think still overwhelmingly scientists fall on one side versus the other, namely. Um, trying to prevent the spread instead of allowing spread to happen. But there was a small contingent of people who were saying, you know, because younger people don't tend to have nearly as bad outcomes, you let it spread among them. And, you know, you'd let them develop herd immunity and maybe everyone gets to continue without having to have restrictions and shut things down. Um, you know, we've seen what this virus has done to 
particular communities of color, but densely populated areas. Uh, that strategy, at the end of the day, you really cannot prevent younger, healthier people from spreading into the vulnerable people. And we just mentioned that younger people can also have, uh, you know, long hauler syndrome, where you have these long-term uh, side effects that last for months and months, and they're susceptible too. And young people do die uh, from this. In fact, there was a, a study from somebody I knew where I trained in medicine. He wrote a great paper recently. Uh, that showed that overall in, across the country, the mortality rate for people uh, between the ages of 18 uh, and 45 skyrocketed during COVID. A lot of unexpected deaths in that age group from COVID. And so, you know, yes, it's still as a percentage basis, much lower uh, for younger people than older people, but it's, it's very um, serious disease and it can be regardless of your age. Um, and so that's definitely a debate where people don't agree, but uh, the vaccine is the best, safest way to get to that herd immunity, 70, 80%. That is uh, for, you know, um, overwhelming vast majority of scientists, the way that you get out of this pandemic. Okay, the, just to uh, follow up on that. So there's been, again, things that have been, I guess, distributed on social media and others that actually medical doctors themselves are not taking it. Nurses are refusing to take it, uh, yet they're trying to impose it upon the rest of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, population. I know just for the, for, for the record here, I know Dr. Nadim has taken it. Dr. Hatem has taken it. Dr. Shreve Anohal has taken it. Uh, a lot of the major and, and doctors and, and, and consultants here at MBIC are all advising to take it. And have they themselves also uh, taken it? Um, but can you maybe address this uh, uh, notion that uh, medical professionals are actually not taking it and waiting for others and seeing what others to do and yet, uh, you know, imposing it or, you know, upon the rest of us, but not doing it themselves. Is that an accurate reflection of the scientific medical establishment as a whole? Uh, no. So the very first priority group was healthcare workers. And uh, the first healthcare worker in New Jersey was vaccinated right here at University Hospital. Uh, was a nurse, um, a Latina nurse in our emergency room, incredible person, Maritza Beniquez. And uh, followed by her, there we've done thousands and thousands of healthcare workers, physicians, nurses, uh, pharmacists, you name it, they've taken the vaccine and remain the number one group type that have taken the vaccine. Of course, there are some folks who are skeptical, just as, just as much as there are folks in the general population uh, who may not be in the healthcare field. Uh, their concerns, from my experience, tend to be around, uh, you know, what are the uh, side effects? Are they tolerable? And many of them were waiting around a week or two to see what how it worked in their colleagues that may be working on their unit, and then they decided to sign up. And so we're now approaching 70% of our staff, again, all healthcare workers who are getting the vaccine, and we keep, we keep doing it. So we're going to reach hopefully near uh, you know, 80, 90%, at least, I think, of our staff who've taken the vaccine, which I'm excited about. Um, and it's a reflection of people, you know, when they read the science, when they understand it, um, they use their training and knowledge, uh, they understand that this is the right course of action. Okay. All right. A um, couple more questions here, just from some of the community members. Okay, I think I've addressed most of the ones that I received. If you get the vaccine, uh, is it possible uh, uh, to therefore get COVID, a full-blown COVID thereafter? Uh, recently, I know, uh, you know, our, our Congresswoman, unfortunately, uh, uh, did contract it and apparently she was, at least had the first shot of Pfizer. Um, you know, Connie, uh, Congressman Bonnie, uh, we pray for her recovery. Um, but is that a, a concern? There's definitely a risk. Uh, as you mentioned, the Congresswoman had one of two vaccines. There's definitely still risk that you contract COVID and you become ill from COVID. 95% is not 100%. And so, you know, uh, that, I mean, that does mean 5% of people in the vaccine arms in these trials uh, were exposed, got COVID-19 and got sick from it. We don't know the counterfactual in terms of, you know, would they have gotten much worse disease. We know, for example, that the flu vaccine 
even though it's only around 60 to 70% effectiveness, uh, what we do know is that if, if you get the flu, it's usually a much less severe, shorter course because your immune system has that training. It may have let the virus get further than you would want, but it still ends up stopping the virus faster than otherwise. And I believe that will be the phenomenon here with these vaccines, uh, but there's certainly still a chance. Uh, are you aware of any uh, plans that this will be something government mandated um, down the line, or do you think that's something that could be a possibility? I don't think it will ever be mandated, uh, but here's what I do think. First of all, it's under an emergency use authorization, which means that um, you know, the FDA determined that the benefits for society outweigh the risks, given the fact that we're in a public health emergency. But we still have two years still of data for these trials, and we'll learn more and more, including about how long immunity lasts, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, because it's under emergency use authorization and not full approval, you're really not going to see many places mandating it because there would be, I think, legal considerations there and also ethical considerations. Uh, because some people may say, hey, I'd rather wait until the studies finish. I don't believe that's the right decision for all the reasons I've been mentioning, uh, but you're not likely to see that. Now, what you are probably going to see is at some point uh, to board a plane, to get on a train, to attend school, to do X, Y, and Z in life, to go to, go to work in your place of work um, in person, you're going to have to take it. And, um, you know, there's going to be a point where folks are going to be asked about it. I do believe that will happen, um, you know, and that's short of a government mandate, you know, like they, you know, around, we're going to fine you if you don't take it or whatever, but it's still pretty compelling. And it's going to be, um, I know there's going to be a lot of controversy around that, but I know that's likely going to come at some point. All right, we have a question here. Um, is it, uh, should, should everyone in the household, every family member, at least over the age of 16, uh, get it or is it necessary or is, you know, if one person gets it, is that sufficient? And there is, and the follow up to that is, is there any necessity after you get the vaccine to go for periodic testing to see if you have COVID? Uh, for the reasons we talked about before around the fact that you can still potentially spread it, even if you don't get sick from it, maybe an asymptomatic carrier, uh, people in your household over the age of 16 for Pfizer and 18 for Moderna. So Moderna was not studying anyone under age of 18. Uh, so a little bit of a difference there. But yes, um, you know, as many members that qualify in your household should be vaccinated. Um, sorry, what was your second question again, Sammy? Second question is, is there any reason to get tested uh, uh, for, I guess, Corona after you've been vaccinated? Some people, I guess, do periodic testing. Uh, that they've been doing maybe in the course of their work or something. Is there any necessity to do that thereafter if they've been vaccinated? Uh, if you've been vaccinated, uh, you don't have to regularly test just because you've been vaccinated, but you should test if you have symptoms or you've been exposed to somebody with COVID-19, uh, just as you would have before you took the vaccine. And how long after the second vaccine is it considered, quote unquote, 95% effective? Is it right on when you get the shot or is there some time period thereafter? There is a time period. Based on what we know about how vaccines normally work and the time your immune system takes, uh, about a month after your second dose is really when uh, you probably hit that 95%. And I say this based on an estimate. There's no hard data uh, from that based on the frequency of the labs they did. But um, that's sort of the rule of thumb and I think it's a good one. The uh, second test. Uh, for both Pfizer and Moderna, uh, I understand is uh, uh, people get hit a little bit hard, harder maybe than the first. Um, what should people expect from that? Uh, maybe so that they don't go into a panic if, if you know, taking the second one um, and their reaction or their body's reaction may be different than after the first dose. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I have my second dose next week, so a little bit anxious about it. But yes, the second dose is gonna be worse in terms of side effects. So whatever you got the first time around, expect to get all of those things a little bit more severe the second time around based on um, what we know from the research, but also all of the anecdotal um, you know, stuff that I'm hearing now. You know, For example, if you had fatigue, you have a little bit sleepy the first time, uh, you may actually be so fatigued that you can't go to work or you, you know, can't get in the car and drive uh, for about a day. And uh, the thing about these side effects is that they are short-lived. 
which is good, right? So um, even the people who told me they have severe fatigue, they can't get out of bed or whatever, that's usually only for max 12 hours, usually much shorter than that. Um, so again, remember that these side effects are a sign that your immune system is responding, learning what the virus looks like and getting inflamed. The reason you feel sick actually when you, when you get a virus is because your immune system is responding. It's revving up uh, your, all of your defenses, which gives you fever, which gives you chills, which gives you uh, fatigue, makes your body tired. So it's a similar thing that's happening because again, your immune system is responding. I can uh, provide firsthand accounts of that second dose response uh, because I got my second dose uh, yesterday afternoon and I felt fine last night, but this morning I definitely felt I had you know, a bit of like, you know, I guess a cold-like feeling, you know, body aches, you know, a bit of chills, then a fever, um, uh, but it's gotten better through the day. Uh, I can tell you that much. And I was able to go to work, you know, drag myself in a little bit, but I was able to manage through the day. I guess that should be correct me if I'm wrong, but it's perfectly safe for us to, you know, with, with these side effects, take the usual, you know, agents you take for like colds, you know, it was antihistamines or it's analgesics like Tylenol or Motrin, these will not affect their, their response to the vaccine. I just want to clear that for the community. So you can take this stuff, you know, and also hydrate yourself and not fear that you will affect the vaccine response, correct? hundred uh, percent. In fact, that's the recommendation. Uh, take things like Tylenol, Advil for muscle aches, um, you know, and some of the other things you can take over the counter for symptoms, all totally fine. Thank you. Uh, which uh, I guess uh, a follow-up for that, um, I know there's a lot of things about what we can uh, supposedly take to help us in terms of maybe not or fighting COVID, uh, but with the vaccines, is there uh, specifically certain things that we should do to help it make it more effective after we have it? Um, you know, in terms of the foods we should be eating or, you know, maybe vitamins we should be taking that may help uh, with the building of the immunity after we take the vaccine. You know, uh, having a nutritious diet, um, in general is good for your immune system and maintaining immunity. There's really not much of a difference in terms of recommendations there. Just eat healthy, uh, make sure you eat vegetables, actually get minerals that provide some of the, um, you know, basic ingredients that your immune system uses to be effective. And that's pretty much it. Okay, okay. Dr. Hatem, I think you had something. Uh, my last question, sorry, uh, is for Dr. Shadi. Um, is there an Islamic uh, obligation uh, to just like to wear masks and to social distance and to cancel Juma or you know gatherings or Ramadan and Tarawiya? Uh, is there an Islamic stance of you know taking the vaccine to help the greater community? Even though I'm 20 years old, I have no medical problems, and um, my risk of dying from this vaccine is very low. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to have the 24 hours of arm discomfort and, um, I don't, I don't want to have the chills that are associated potentially with this vaccine. Um, so I'm not going to take it. Is, is there any stance on that? Uh, that's a good question. And the answer is that, uh, it is an obligation to avoid harm. It is wajib. Once harm is predominant doesn't have to be absolute and certain. There's a predominant by the uh, experts in a certain field that there will be a harm in something. So once that's established, it does become binding to avoid it. And it, it does, and avoiding it is gonna be by the means that are available. So um, I don't wanna say anything like specific is obligatory to do this, specific means, but in general, it does become an obligation once there's a predominant vun, right? Like a, a dominant speculation. You don't need absolute knowledge. Ab you don't have to have absolute certainty of a harm. You just need the predominant prevailing view that something is harmful, that it becomes binding on you to avoid it. Yeah. I think Dr. Adam, you, you, it's a very good point you bring up, you know, there uh, and consideration, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, just even if there's a, uh, uh, um, uh, not necessarily by Sharia, you're compelled to do something uh, in this particular case. I don't know if that's what you were specifically getting at, uh, but I think that's something that we can all consider is just being, uh, you know, in the general principles of being concerned about others. 
is, is, is such an integral part of our deen. And, uh, you know, um, and I think we should avoid, you know, I think sometimes if we say these things out loud to ourselves, oh, I will wait to see what happens to my neighbor, right? To see whether or not I will do it, right? Just say that out loud to yourself because these thoughts do come to our mind, right? Uh, you know, even though you're eligible and you could, you know, be part of the process of trying to fight this disease, uh, say that out loud to yourself and see if that resonates with you, uh, you know, rather than just leaving it in your head. Uh, because I, I think, you know, that, that that's one of the things I think from the beginning at MBIC, uh, when, when this thing had uh, spread out, we really tried to emphasize with the community that let's not think about, oh, he's going to give it to me. He's going to give it to me. Oh, let me stay away. But no, I may have it and start from there. I have it and I may give it to him. So therefore, I want to protect him from me rather than thinking about everyone's out to get me uh, and those types of things. Take the initiative for yourself to be concerned about others. I'm wearing the mask not to protect myself, but to protect my brother or sister from me, right? Uh, that if we take upon that attitude, I think that completely shifts our actions and how we view the surrounding environment, how we view our brothers and sisters, right? If you're sitting at home thinking, I don't need it, I'm young. Well, think of your parents. Think of your grandparents. What threat are you putting them into? Uh, think of uh, the community members you're coming to in contact with. Think of your neighbors, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, because you don't quote unquote need it, uh, but in fact, you may be actually putting other people's lives in danger or at least in difficulty. Uh, that's not a good place spiritually to be. Uh, so, you know, not necessarily that you, the Sharia commands at this point, Allah Alam, and it's for a scholar, Sheikh Shadi, uh, you know, uh, for others to evaluate whether or not that is specific at this time, but just the idea of the principle of it, that we don't want to be in a realm where we're thinking about, let them do it, let them get it, let me think only about me. No, we should be thinking about others, especially uh, in this pandemic. That's, a, that's a, such an ethos of our deen and our religion uh, that we don't want to be like others that we see as such an ugly characteristic we see expressed uh, by others in society who vocalize these things. And like I said, sometimes in our head, it doesn't sound so bad. So just go to the mirror and say what you're thinking out loud. And I'm sure when you hear yourself, you'll say, this is not within the Islamic ethos. This is not within the Muhammadan ethos. This is not the way of our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be only focused on me and what is in my interest. Uh, you know, and I think every, uh, you know, one of the things that I, when I talk to doctors or nurses on the front line, uh, you know, whenever they're, they're so uh, passionate oftentimes about like, why are people in the community doing this and this and this? Don't they see what we see? Why are they disobeying certain social distancing realms in their households? Why are they doing these grand parties, you know, if they are doing them? Uh, because if they see what I see, they wouldn't do it. They would be concerned, right? Because by you, you know, you're, you're the healthcare workers, they're the ones who are also on the front line. They're putting their lives on the line. Uh, because oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, not because people are working, not because people have to earn a living, not because people got it by accident by, you know, in this place or that place, taking all the necessary precautions, which may happen, but they got it because they decided to have a 400 person wedding, or they got it because they had decided to have people over their house, even though they were advised not to, not wearing masks, etc. So really, we just have to start thinking about this. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of making sure that we're thinking about others, you know, don't be putting people's lives uh, in danger. Don't be putting our uh, doctor's lives in danger because you need to be treated because we acted irresponsibly. We don't want to be in that, uh, that state. That is not a part of the Islamic or Muslim ethos. So uh, that's just my two cents on the matter. And as you can say, it's, there's, a, there's a sense of frustration. And it's a frustration because talking to imams, talking to sheikhs, talking to community leaders, Oftentimes, they're even put, they're even being put in awkward positions by community members and it, it putting maybe their lives at danger, their family lives at danger. And, and, and because of their adab and akhlaq, a lot of these imams and sheikhs are, you know, don't feel fully comfortable to, you know, to offend somebody, this and that. You're putting them in a horrible position. And we see many, we see several of our imams in our communities, uh, unfortunately, and, and leaders, uh, because of being put in these situations, actually ended up with COVID themselves. Right and 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 suffered through that. So we don't want to, uh, you know, be putting people's lives at danger. Let's keep that Islamic and prophetic and Muhammadan ethos of being concerned for the other, uh, and and what can I do to assist the health and the benefit of the other, not only of myself. Uh, what's in it for me, right? We don't want to come out of this pandemic more selfish than we were when we went in, right? No, we want to come out of it that I did something, I did a sacrifice, I did something maybe even I was uncomfortable with or I didn't have to do. 
for the sake of uh, my brother, my sister, in humanity, in deen, in family, whatever it is, inshallah ta'ala. This is a global fight, right? And I think one of the things we should always keep in mind, this is not just an American issue, right? It's a worldwide issue. Uh, uh, and, and it is affecting the, the, the Muslim community and Muslim world as well as it's affecting everyone else. Uh, and so we want to be part of the solution, inshallah ta'ala, uh, for that. Uh, Dr. Sharif, uh, do you have any concluding remarks for Dr. Hatham uh, or Dr. Nadim? Uh, thank you, Sammy. I'll start and just, um, first of all, thank you and everyone here for joining today to have this discussion. I think it's not only important to have these discussions, but in the context of our community and uh, especially the, the questions about, you know, uh, fiqh and our deen and how that interfaces with these complex topics. I learned a lot there and, um, you know, I think it's uh, just a great opportunity, uh, alhamdulillah, that I was able to uh, come and have this discussion with all of you. Uh, I echo what Sammy said. I think it's a collective um, call to action. Uh, and look, everyone has their journey on this. Uh, as much as I, I do think it's something people should do, um, you know, the, the extent to which we all become comfortable, I think you have to let people get there. And, you know, part of this process is having these discussions. And I, I want to thank NBIC for that platform. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Al-Nahal, uh, Sheikh Shadi, Dr. Nadim, any other closing thoughts, Dr. Hatham? Uh, no, I'll just uh, echo your wonderful comments, Shadi, and uh, I mean, Sammy, on, uh, on the importance of us working collectively as an ummah in our community to benefit not just ourselves, but more importantly, the other. I think that's a great comment, uh, a great and important, important note to make, uh, particularly for our younger folks. And also as a reminder to us that you know, even with the vaccine coming out, this is still not a time to let our guard down, particularly in this time when the pandemic is still raging throughout the state and the country. We all see the practice social distancing, wear our masks, you know, uh, we have, you know, wash our hands, you have the almost hygienic standards. You know, it, it's, uh, we just have to be more patient uh, for some more time. Inshallah, you know, Allah will, will, will lift us from this pandemic. We still gotta persevere and, and, and get through this, um, you know, through this time. So, um, you know, with that being said, I hope that today's talk, a wonderful talk led by, um, you know, Dr. Sharif on the hall, really helps to provide us more confidence uh, in the uh, promise and the benefits of this vaccine and dispelling some of the concerns and myths and misconceptions and, you know, um, false truths uh, behind this vaccine. Um, it's a, an important effort that I think all communities at some point need to lead. With their, with, their, with their people so we can help, you know, get people comfortable. I mean, the, the biggest challenge we'll face now going forward is to get the community buy-in. Because as people said, it's great to make a vaccine, but it doesn't do, doesn't do nothing until it gets pe into people's arms. Um, so we hope that, you know, with Street from the Hall, well, um, this would be a great starting point. We will intend, we did this, this talk was, was being recorded. And inshallah, I think in time, well, I'll ask the RBIC staff, to get this posted on our YouTube channel and then spread the word, uh, particularly amongst our community members um, in, uh, outside NBIC, whether it's in North Jersey, South Jersey. And I hope Dr. Shriva Hall, I hope, I know you're a busy guy, I know you're called by all sorts of media, you know, na particularly nationally these days, um, you know, and I'm sure you might get future requests from other communities in, um, in the Masajid areas to come by. I hope you can afford some time I hope your wife and kids will allow you to do that because I think this is a great thing you've done for our community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, inshallah, we will then uh, uh, formally uh, close. Uh, Sheikh Shadi, if you can uh, uh, just make a dua. Maybe we can make that a slogan of tonight's program. And whenever you get in the vaccine, you can start the hashtag, I did it for you. I did it for you, rather than focusing on, I'm trying to protect myself. But maybe we can start that uh, hashtag going to encourage people uh, to, 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 to treat this battle against this uh, disease uh, through uh, helping uh, and being concerned with others, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, Sheikh Shadi, inshallah, if you want to close with dua. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk wal asr. Inna al-insana la fi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa aminu al-salihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi.
I'm on. Jazakallah Khairan. Thank you for everybody for joining us uh, tonight. And inshallah, I'll continue to uh, stay in touch. And, and thank you so much to our special guest, Dr. Sharif Al Nahal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and preserve you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.